uh, it's my 12th book, but it's, uh, it's been different from uh, uh, all those who preceded it and, and those that will hopefully follow because it was a labor of love. Uh, I, uh, I was and became a close friend of uh, Isaac Rabin, mostly during, uh, through our work uh, together. Um, these were unusual four years uh, in, in diplomacy, uh, in being ambassador in Washington, in being chief negotiator with Syria, and in being uh, a member of uh, Rabin's close uh, circle. So when uh, Yale University Press asked me to uh, write the Rabin biography in their Jewish Lives series, um, I, I felt that uh, this was something I had to do and something that I wanted to do. And in the course of uh, researching and writing the book, I came to know Rabin even better than I did uh, during the years of our friendship and, and work together. I reached back into his childhood, into the family background, into the unusual mother that uh, gave birth to, uh, uh, to Rabin, and uh, came to know and understand uh, things that uh, I did not fully comprehend when I was just working with uh, Rabin or, or just uh, enjoy his company and, uh, and leadership. So let me um, start my remarks by speaking about uh, Rabin's death before I speak about his life. This may sound a bit peculiar, but uh, assassinated uh, leaders are distinguished by their assassination. The assassination creates a myth. Uh, it gives a, a particular meaning to, uh, to the life. It puts life in a, a particular light. Um, we think of other great assassinated leaders, of, obviously in the United States, about Lincoln, about uh, Kennedy, in India about Gandhi, and so forth and so forth. And uh, in that regard, the death or the assassination cannot be separated from, uh, from the life. Now, Rabin's death or assassination was particularly important. It was obviously a heinous uh, crime. Uh, the first assassination of a Jewish prime minister by a Jewish person in Israel. Um, there was a mindset in Israel that I think Rabin himself shared that um, the danger of assassination or an attack on the prime minister would come from an Arab, not from a Jew. And part of what explains the insufferable uh, facility with which it was done was that mindset. But the fact of life was that uh, he was assassinated by a Jew. In fact, the writing was on the wall. If we go back in our memories, or you can find it in the book, to the month that preceded the assassination, the incitement, the hatred, and the near, the near misses, the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, people hostile to Rabin came very, very close to him on a number of occasions. He was not well protected. Today's Israeli uh, prime ministers are as well protected as uh, the president of the United States, but that obviously was too late for, uh, for Rabin. Um, now, uh, as I said, the assassination puts life in a particular context and throws a particular light on life. Not, not every assassinated leader had a meaningful life. One of the most uh, famous assassinations was that of the uh, Austrian uh, crown prince in 1914 that threw the world into the World War I. Uh, but what do we know about his life? He did not have a meaningful life before that. Rabin, like Kennedy and like Lincoln, had a, a very meaningful life before that, a very meaningful and important career um, that had a significance of, uh, of their own. So let me speak a bit about, uh, uh, about the life. Um, at some point, I, I thought about calling the book Native Son because uh, Isaac Rabin was the quintessential Sabra. Uh, was born in uh, Tel Aviv within uh, or inside the, the, the labor uh, movement uh, establishment, uh, had a classic uh, Sabra Israeli childhood, went to uh, uh, elementary school in Tel Aviv, went to the uh, uh, famous prestigious agricultural school in the Jezreelon Valley, the Keduri school that was the best high school in the country. And uh, in the course of being a student at the Kaduri High School, it turned out that he was uh, unusually bright. Uh, he uh, was the valedictorian of his class. He received a special prize from the British High Commissioner. And had there been no World War II, 
he probably would have gone to California to study water engineering because that's what he wanted to do. But in the 1940s were not the usual time. And he joined the uh, defense forces of the Yishuv, the Jewish community uh, in Palestine. And soon enough, it transpired that he also had an unusual uh, talent for military affairs. Uh, he joined the uh, elite unit of uh, the Haganah, the militia of the uh, Jewish community. And the commander of that militia, Igor Alon, uh, identified the talent and turned Rabin into his uh, lieutenant, uh, planning officer, deputy. And Rabin rose quickly through the ranks. And uh, by the time uh, the War of Independence broke out in 1947-1948, he was already a fairly senior officer became the commander of a brigade that fought on the road to Jerusalem and in Jerusalem. And I'm emphasizing this fact because uh, his fighting for Jerusalem uh, was a very important fact uh, 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 or period in, in his life. Uh, he had a particular attachment to Jerusalem and he also felt that uh, the IDF had not been well prepared for the war. Uh, Rabin's brigade uh, lost almost half of its uh, men in, in the war. It was a very brutal experience. And the fact that Rabin chose to stay in military service at the end of the war had to do with that because he vowed that uh, he personally will not let that happen again and he will devote uh, his life to making sure that Israel would not be caught off guard uh, a second time. So between 1949 and 1967, Rabin was uh, in the IDF and played a very important role in building, improving the IDF, and bringing it to the point in 1967 uh, when it uh, performed brilliantly in the Six Day War and turned Israel from a Middle Eastern state into a, a Middle Eastern power. And of course, uh, with massive uh, consequences of that war. I, I would say at this point that one of the ironies of Rabin's uh, life and death was that. As the chief of staff in 1967, he was in charge of capturing the Sinai, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank. And as prime minister in the 1990s, he was in the process of negotiating peace on the basis of territory for peace, which became controversial and which led to his death. So the winner of 1967, at the end of his life, was a victim of the consequences of 1967. Um, Rabin, uh, uh, Rabin was not uh, a man given uh, endowed with natural charisma. He was not a Moshe Dayan, he was not an Eagle alone, not one of those uh, uh, young officers who at the age of 18 and 20 were appointed to and people said, oh, he's going to be chief of staff, he's going to be prime minister. He did not have that uh, uh, charisma. He actually was a very shy, introverted uh, person. Um, and uh, what he had was not so much charisma, but uh, authority. Um, and I, I subtitled the book, A Soldier, Leader, Statesman, because I wanted to point to the evolution of uh, Rabin's personality and life. He began as a soldier. He became a, a real leader uh, only uh, in the 1980s as Minister of Defense, when he established his position in Israeli life as Mr. National Security, and he became an international statesman in the 1990s when he uh, went against his own grain and was willing to make massive, uh, painful compromises in order to put Israel on a path for, uh, for peace. So soldier, leader, uh, statesman. So uh, as I mentioned before, Rabin had the talent for military affairs. Um, and he played a, a very important role in the 1950s and 60s in building the, uh, uh, the IDF as uh, head of operations, as head of instruction, as deputy chief of staff, and finally between 1964 and 1967 as uh, chief of staff. Uh, Rabin had a couple of setbacks. It was not an easy ride to, uh, uh, to the top. Uh, on the eve of the Six-Day War, uh, he, uh, he collapsed. Um, uh, for two days, uh, he was out of commission. Um, and uh, later as the prime minister, uh, he had to resign over the, uh, the bank account held by uh, his wife in, in Washington. 
but the interesting fact is that uh, these setbacks uh, in the long run uh, did not impede his career. The fact that the chief of staff was a human being who, uh, who had to cope with the tension as a human being made actually a, a favorable impression on the Israeli public. And the fact that uh, when the bank account was uh, discovered and uh, was played into a big issue in the Israeli media and, and politics, Rabin resigned. It took him a couple of days and he, uh, he resigned. And again, uh, people said, oh, here is a gentleman. He did not try to hide behind his wife's back. Um, there was a, um, a misdeed and he, uh, he was willing to take responsibility and pay for it. So in the long run, uh, these two mishaps uh, did not uh, prevent Rabin from, uh, from moving on. I mentioned Rabin's first tenure. Um, uh, he was uh, elected prime minister surprisingly when he came back from being ambassador in Washington to replace Golda Meir, who had to resign because of the setback of uh, the October 19th of the Yom Kippur War. And uh, since he was a, a highly regarded military man and he had nothing to do with the setback of 1973, and the Labour Party chose him to replace Golda Meir. Um, the first century was not great. Uh, Rabin did not come fully into his own as Prime Minister in his first term, and it ended, as I mentioned before, un ungracefully with his resignation. And people assumed that his, uh, his career was over. Uh, but uh, tenaciously, he, uh, he, he rebuilt his career. He became Defense Minister in 1984 and excelled in that, in that role, his uh, authority and military affairs and his other qualities. He was straightforward. Uh, to the point, what you saw was what you got, um, um, spoke plainly to the public. Uh, I remember many occasions when, as Minister of Defense, there was a, a tragedy in Lebanon, two or three soldiers were killed, Rabin would appear on television, uh, would look uh, directly into the camera and say, I am the Minister of Defense, and as such, I am responsible for what happened. Not very common among uh, politicians, but this was, this was Rabin. This was a very engaging quality of his. And later on, when I was uh, a witness to the love affair that developed between him and Bill Clinton, I could see how important for Clinton was the fact that he knew that uh, Rabin was a man of his word and what he said he, uh, uh, he was committed to and delivered and, uh, and performed, something that uh, a US president very much appreciates in an Israeli prime minister that he has to, uh, that he has to deal with. So these, these qualities of uh, integrity, directness, honesty, uh, authority, were the ones who built uh, Rabin's uh, position in the Israeli public. And in the early 1990s, the uh, leadership and membership of the Labour Party decided that Shimon Peres st stood no chance of ever winning an election, removed Peres from the leadership, put Rabin in the leadership, and he was elected for a rare second uh, opportunity to be uh, to be prime minister. So that was important because uh, Rabin was fully aware of the fact that this doesn't happen uh, all very often, that somebody is given a second chance uh, of that nature. And he was determined to, uh, to accomplish significant develop, uh, achievements during his tenure. He was not there to enjoy the trappings of power, such as they are in Israeli politics, but he was there to make a difference. And uh, what he wanted was uh, to call it fix Israel's relationship with its immediate neighbors. Rabin saw the danger in the East, in Iran and Iraq. And uh, together with the Clinton administration, he understood that you had to fix Israel's relationship with its immediate neighbors in order to face the more serious dangers uh, in the in the east, Iraq today is not an issue, but Iran, as we know, is the issue. And Rabin saw that uh, uh, saw that uh, early uh, early on. So this was um, and this was the life. This was the uh, uh, this was the career. And now to the uh, to the legacy. Um, so Rabin was uh, uh, Rabin was assassinated. The assassination. And 
two major consequences. A line was crossed in Israeli politics, and uh, uh, the people who incited, uh, the people who called for violence, uh, have not really gone through the soul searching that they and their leadership should have. We still have radical rabbis in the West Bank, like for violence. It may not be the, the last assassination that uh, we have seen in Israel, and that the crossing of that line was very significant. Also, Israel's uh, peace policy was dealt a, a great blow, not a final blow, because after the assassination, there were still significant efforts um, uh, to make peace between Israel and Syria and Israel and, and the Palestinians. Of all people, Ariel Sharon and, of course, uh, um, Netanyahu and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Eud uh, Olmert and of course Eud Barak. So the key, the assassination of Rabin was not uh, the end of uh, Israel's peace policy, but it, it was a, a great blow because Rabin was the leader who uh, not just wanted to make peace, but has the authority to carry with him uh, the Israeli public. And this is exactly what the killer had in mind. Uh, there's a, a video of the assassination that was filmed by an amateur who uh, was shooting from across the street, in this case, shooting film, but could have, could have been shooting something else. And we see something very interesting. The Rabin and Perez at the end of the rally, they came down the stairs, walking to their cars, and in the middle of uh, uh, going down the stairs, Rabin said to Perez, you know, we haven't thanked the organizers properly. I'm going back to thank them. Would you like to join me? And Perez said, oh, no, I'll go home. So Perez continues down, uh, down the steps, and the killer is sitting there waiting, and he, you, the, the, the camera focuses on the face of the killer, and you could see that he's thinking, thinking, should I kill Shimon Perez or not? And figuring out that if he kills Shimon Perez, he won't get to kill Isaac Rabin. And for him, in order to stop the Oslo process, he had to kill Rabin, not Perez, so he spares Perez's life, and what happens next, we all... Uh, uh, we all know. So it was a very consequential moment in Israeli life. So what I tried to do in the book was to, to tell, first of all, a, a story of, of a life and a career, to depict uh, the persona of, uh, of a man and a leader, and also to look at some of the broader issues that uh, the story uh, puts into uh, a very stark relief, and hopefully I did well. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Itamar. That was uh, a really useful overview of, I want to show the book, of this book, um, uh, just in case there are people on the phone who are, actually haven't read it. Um, you should run out. If you don't have it, we will send it to you. So please ask us if you haven't read it yet. We'll make sure you get it. Uh, that's uh, um, a wonderful um, uh, way to begin our conversation. And I'd now like to invite everyone on the phone if you have a question for Itamar, um, you can unmute your, commuter, your computers, um, and then please use star four um, to let us know that you should get in line to pose a question. If you're on the phone, use star four. If you're on a computer, what did I do? just unmute yourself, and we will know to put you in line. But I'm going to take the... Um, uh, the prerogative of opening the conversation by asking you this, Itamar. In your first couple of sentences, you referred to the fact that sometimes assassinations have the, uh, the effect of creating um, a myth around um, the, the person assassinated. And this, of course, is um, uh, Rabin was not immune to this phenomenon after his death. And he has emerged, depending on where you, where you sit on the political spectrum, He's emerged as the sort of favorite political icon of different um, uh, points on the spectrum, from the far left to the center, not so much the far right, of course, but people of different views, center and right, the center and left, have adopted um, uh, Rabin. And I'd like to ask you how, how you see where he ended up politically by the time he was assassinated. Um, and then whether you agree with the idea of the inexorable evolution of, 
of Yitzhak Rabin's political ideology that some have ascribed to him um, over time. Okay, let, uh, thank you, Rob. Let me share uh, an episode with you. In, in November uh, 1995, shortly after the assassination, there was a meeting in Boston that Rabin should have addressed of the Council of Jewish Federations. And uh, there was, it of course obviously became a memorial evening for Rabin. Uh, Henry Kissinger was there. And as speaker after speaker uh, described Rabin as a, a very dovish person, Kissinger leaned over to me and said, uh, Yitzchak was not a flower child. Uh, because Rabin, Rabin was not a dovish person. Rabin, uh, the, one of the unique uh, aspects of, uh, of his policy that made it so uh, effective was that he combined peace and security. He wanted peace, but it was always embedded in a view of Israeli security. It was uh, in the context of, of, of security. And we don't know how far Rabin would have gone. The last uh, uh, speech that he gave on, on the topic in the Knesset when the vote was uh, held for, uh, to approve also too, he said a Palestinian entity less than a state. Now, it may have been a bargaining position, it may have not, it will always remain an open uh, an open question, but uh, um, uh, so the, uh, it, it was not a dovish uh, uh, outlook. And, uh, and he, uh, as I said before, he wanted to consolidate uh, Israel's existence to put the uh, uh, Israeli-Palestinian relationship on a solid basis. He was ready to uh, to make a massive concession to Syria in order to make peace with Syria. I would also add that actually Rabin preferred to make a Syria first policy, not a, a Palestine first policy. And he gave the famous deposit to Secretary of State Christopher. Unfortunately, the deposit was not well used by uh, the Secretary of State. And, and Rabin went to Oslo, not as a first choice, but as a second choice. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the October uh, 95 speech um, for the benefit of the, the people on this video conference. Uh, um, I remember well the Washington Institute uh, meeting with Rabin just a couple of weeks before that speech. It was our 10th anniversary trip to, uh, to the Middle East. Um, uh, um, uh, I had the privilege of leading the delegation from Kuwait to Jordan to Israel, and we went and met uh, met with Rabin in September, late September, and he uttered those same words to our group, um, uh, which have stuck in my mind ever since. Um, and I think your emphasis on the the relationship between security and peace is absolutely um, right on the mark. Uh, let me open the floor to questions. So, um, j just as people are doing this, let me ask you one more question, Itamar. And, the, and um, I, you, you referred in your remarks to the relationship with Bill Clinton. I wonder if you could expand on that for a minute and talk more broadly about how Rabin saw the U.S.-Israel strategic relationship over time and whether that evolved as well. Okay. That, uh, uh, Rabin's view of, uh, of the United States and its imposition of Israel went back a long way. Uh, his father, Nehemia, Nehemiah, uh, was born in Ukraine, uh, escaped the Tsar to uh, the United States, to St. Louis, uh, and then came uh, with the Jewish Legion to Palestine in 1917. And uh, he uh, used to tell uh, his young son about uh, the wonders of America. So Rabin had been preconditioned to, to have this very positive attitude. In the 1950s, when he was a senior officer in the IDF, he preferred an American orientation. Uh, some of the roots of his rivalry with Shimon Peres go back to, to that time when Shimon Peres had a European orientation and Rabin had an American orientation. And, and then uh, after he was the, the glorious, victorious chief of staff in 1967, Prime Minister Shkola asked him, uh, what would you like to do now? And he said, I want to be ambassador in Washington. Rabin wanted to go into politics. He, 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 I don't think he expected to become prime minister anytime soon, but
but he wanted to be a member of the cabinet. And he knew that he had a limited perspective as a military man. He needed to broaden his uh, horizons and perspective. And he thought that a stint in Washington would do that. And uh, surprise the court agreed and sent him to Washington. He was a very effective ambassador in Washington. Um, and he had a mentor in international uh, politics and American politics called Henry Kissinger, who was the national security advisor. And they became very close uh, friends, a friendship that lingered for, uh, for many years. And Rabin came back very much affected by the American way of, of life. Um, his mother, I should I mentioned before, the interesting mother, her nickname was Red Rosa. She was a, a firebrand socialist uh, who came from Russia. The rabbi who came back from Washington was far away from the son of Red Rosa. He very much immersed in the American way, way of life. So, of course, to him, uh, beyond the, these emotions, uh, America was the, uh, the great ally and uh, cultivating that relationship, turning Israel into a strategic uh, ally was very important. I want in this context to mention uh, the events of September 1970. Uh, at that time, Syria invaded Jordan. Syria was a Soviet client. Jordan was an American client. Um, and it was a major problem for the Nixon administration. Uh, Vietnam War, nobody wanted to see the United States uh, become embroiled in another Middle Eastern war. And there was a local ally called Israel that took care of the problem for the United States. Rabin masterminded it together with Kissinger from, from Washington. And there was a, an ever grateful Nixon and uh, it became a, a very important uh, point of reference in American-Israeli relations that Israel was not a recipient of American aid, but uh, was a, a valuable proven strategic uh, ally. And that, that remained of course uh, a very important uh, uh, guideline for Rabin later on as Minister of Defense and as uh, Prime Minister. And, and just on that theme, how did that uh, carry over into uh, the way he worked with um, uh, U.S. administrations in terms of peace negotiations? Were they partners? How far did he go in, in, uh, in revealing himself? And what were the limits? Um, okay, first of all, uh, uh, it was bipartisan. Uh, uh, Rabin, uh, Rabin became prime minister when uh, uh, Bush was president and Baker was secretary of state, and he got along famously with them. Um, actually, when, when Clinton was running, uh, Rabin was a bit apprehensive because the notion of a democratic former southern governor reminded him of Jimmy Carter. With whom he did not have a great, uh, not have a great relationship, um, so he was a bit uh, coy about uh, about that, but uh, was careful. And actually, a new relationship began in March 1993 when Rabin came for his first visit uh, to the Clinton White House. And as I mentioned before, uh, it it was uh, almost love at first sight. They liked each other, they appreciated each other. Now, there were moments of tension. Um, uh, the United States very much wanted Israel to, to, to make the deal with Syria, even when President Assad did not respond well to Rabin's deposit. But uh, Rabin stood his ground. And uh, there were a few other moments that I witnessed. Uh, I should open brackets here and say that some of the most interesting moments one can have in life is to be the, the note taker in meetings between the Israeli Prime Minister and the US uh, President or Secretary of, of State. So I could witness that relationship uh, develop. And, you know, we've become used to that. But the, the first time that the US uh, President came to an APAC policy conference uh, was in 1994 when Clinton came because of Rabin. That was a, a first. Um, so uh, it was bipartisan. Um, when it was important to stand one's ground, Robin stood it, and there, there could be some tense moments. But on the whole, he was always honest with his American counterparts. And I found out that uh, sometimes a US president doesn't like to hear the word no, but he much prefers to hear no than to hear a, a yes and a maybe, and then to find out that uh, the yes and the maybe are a Middle Eastern no. 
<laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Um, again, um, uh, inviting people on the phone. I know there are quite a few people on the phone or on the video um, to ask a question from the video. Please unmute, and I see that uh, symbol to uh, to ask a question on the phone. Uh, please press star four, and I will uh, I will call on you then. Um, Shelley, I see you've unmuted yourself. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a couple of questions. If you could talk to us a little bit, Itamar, about kind of the personal dynamic of working uh, for such a man and, and, and what the relationship that you had on a, on a personal level, if you could, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that. And then, again, when you look at um, the field of candidates um, emerging in Israel now, how, how much is Rabin's legacy pointed to by some of the younger candidates, and do do you, you know just what's your sense of that? And uh, you, you know where where young people are going to in the leadership that they're they're looking at or back at, um, which is you know of course very interested, very interesting uh, in this country too. Thank you. Okay, uh, before I before I answer your questions, I'd like to to mention one. one thing. There is a great interest in the world. The book is now being published in seven other languages, from Russian and Chinese to Portuguese and, and, and Spanish and Romanian and Serbian. And it's, a, it's, it's really a tribute to, to the impact that the Rabin name uh, and brand has uh, internationally. Uh, now, to, the, uh, uh, to your first question about the, uh, the personal aspect. So uh, I'd, I'd known Robin uh, before I, I went to work for him. Um, and first time I met him, I was a young intelligence officer and lieutenant. And he was chief of staff, and I would sometimes be brought in to brief him on what was going on under, uh, in the Golan Heights. Uh, later on, I, uh, I became an academic. I was in, in a sort of a research institute at Tel Aviv University. And uh, Rabin as prime minister and then as opposition uh, figure uh, used to invite me to talk about the Middle East. And at some point, the Rabins began to invite us home and we began to invite them. So it was a professional and a sort of superficial uh, 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 social friendship. Um, when, he was, uh, um, when he was elected prime minister, he invited me to his home. And this is again a, a classic uh, uh, Robin moment. Um, I, I expected that he wanted to talk to me either about the Syrian negotiations or about Washington. So, um, and he was no, uh, not, not a great uh, person for small talk. So I, I came in and he said, you know, my most immediate problem is I need, uh, I need to, to replace the negotiator with Syria. I said, can you, can you think of someone who, uh, uh, who knows the subject matter and has a public profile in Israel? Well, it was very awkward to say, uh, okay, I can think of myself. So uh, obviously he, he didn't want to risk a negative answer. So he chose this uh, roundabout way. So I said, well, I could think of a couple of names maybe. He said, I'm not interested in a couple of names. I said, I'd be very happy to do it. He said, oh, I'm so delighted. And this is how I was recruited. And then he said, we'll talk about other things later. By other things, he meant the, the Washington Embassy. So we started to work together. And within a matter of weeks, we it became very, very close. Uh, we spoke on the phone almost every day. Um, he gave full support uh, and full loyalty. And he demanded full loyalty. And there was also sometimes a light side to things. Uh, obviously, there was the rivalry with Shimon Peres. Shimon Peres was my nominal boss as ambassador. Robin was my boss as uh, chief negotiator with Syria and ultimately responsible for the relationship with the United States. And it, it was sometimes very awkward to, to be in the middle of that rivalry. So one day I uh, came back from Washington to, for consultations in, in Jerusalem. Robin was busy with the Prime Minister Major of Britain, so I went to see Ferris first. 
And then Rabin invited me after dinner to his home. I came to his home, smiled, and he said, so you came today? I said, yes. He said, what did you do uh, since, what have you done since you arrived? I said, well, I went to see Shimon Paris. He smiled and said, I know. <laughs> so always testing. Um, so uh, as I said before, there was no, there was no small talk. It was always business-like. Uh, a conversation with Rabin was always about policy, politics, serious issues. Um, but uh, this shy, introverted, uh, sometimes difficult to, not accessible person, once he trusted you and liked you, opened up and, and was, was very soft and very, uh, very kind. So um, it, it really became a, a very close relationship. And when I heard the terrible news uh, on the day of the assassination, I, I first and foremost thought about my friend, only later about what it meant for the country. And now to the, to the second question about well, the, the last person to run on a Robin ticket was Ehud Barak in 99. He, uh, uh, he cast himself as a younger version of Robin, the former chief of staff, a man whose uh, peace policy would be embedded in, in security uh, and so forth. Uh, since then, uh, it, it has not happened. Uh, uh, Ariel Sharon was in a way of the Robin uh, mold, but uh, it didn't definitely by the way, Rabin and, and, and Sharon had a very close uh, relationship, but uh, other, other candidates, uh, Bougie Herzog or uh, uh, other leaders of the Labour Party are not in the Rabin mold and are not making uh, an effort. If you think about Avi Gabay, if today, if Avi Gabay would, would try to turn himself into a Rabin, it, it would be awkward and not, not in place. Uh, the, the person who has the a very difficult time the coping with uh, with Robin was uh, Bibi Netanyahu because uh, uh, he's accused of taking part in the incitement never I, I'd like to emphasize never incitement for assassination but incitement against Robin Robin personally and uh, he uh, obviously is very much preoccupied with his own uh, reputation and place in history and uh, the special place that Robin has in uh, in the public mind and Israeli history is something that Netanyahu has a difficult uh, time coping with. Um, it's more, let, let me ask you a question that connects uh, uh, some of Rabin's thinking and terminology to uh, today's peace process politics. Um, it was when Rabin was prime minister that the concept of uh, um, security settlements versus political settlements was something that entered the lexicon. It's not really a distinction that we hear of today. Today, it's more geographic, inside the fence or outside the fence. But what did Rabin mean when he, when he talked about security settlements versus political settlements? And do you think that that concept still has, should have resonance today? But Rabin's, uh, uh, Rabin's original thinking, actually, after 67, uh, was a territorial compromise. Uh, he wanted a territorial compromise with Egypt in the Sinai, and he wanted a territorial compromise with Jordan over the West Bank. Syria was not seen as a potential uh, peace partner at, uh, at that time. So, uh, uh, and he wanted to keep the strategic uh, the strategic points in, in the West Bank uh, at, the, at the time, and obviously settlements in those places were what you call security settlements. Later on, when the settlement project began to, to expand, he felt that uh, this was actually undermining Israeli security, that the resources uh, given to the, uh, uh, to the West Bank settlements came at the expense of other issues. Other issues would be to uh, uh, absorb the Russian immigration, the million people who came in the 1990s, to build the infrastructure for uh, Israel for the 21st century. And later on, it became an irritant in Israel's relationship with the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, and of course, he was very much abhorred by the violence of the settlements and the radical 
uh, right wing, and then he began to use very harsh language, speaking about the uh, uh, speaking about the settlers. It it it, it became a, a very bad relationship. He spoke about the cancer in the body of the nation, and so forth. And they, of course, did not spare any words with regard to him. Um, can I ask? Oh, Muriel, yes, please. We hear you fine. I Go ahead. I wanted to continue the conversation about Syria. What was the state of thought of Rabin's thought about the Golan Heights at the time? And what what were the serious red lines he would not cross? But an added question was why did he feel that Syria was more important in negotiations than um, working with the Palestinians, given that the world was so concerned about the Palestinians? And Rabin uh... Rabin thought the following, that uh, uh, the Israeli-Syrian conflict was simpler than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a national conflict between two nationalisms, uh, each of them, you know, believing that it has absolute right to the same piece of, of land. Very difficult to find a solution to a national uh, conflict. With Syria, it became, basically became a territorial conflict. Once Syria was willing to make peace and accept Israel, it was a territorial conflict over the, uh, the Golan Heights. Second, Syria, you know, this sounds a bit uh, peculiar today that Syria today doesn't exist as a country. In the days of the father of Hafez al-Assad, Syria was a strong country, a solid country, with a strong uh, uh, leader who was very difficult to negotiate with, but was a man of his word, and when he made a deal, he kept it when he signed the disengagement agreement in 1974, he kept it to, uh, to the letter. Um, so Rabin's uh, and the American, the US uh, view was the same, that uh, it would be better to start a peace process by making an Israeli-Syrian deal, and then it would be easier to make a Palestinian deal because the Palestinians would, would lose one of the main supporters, would be second in line, and we could get a better Palestinian deal once you had a Syrian deal in place. But since Syria did not prove um, a ready partner for, for the deal, Rabin had to settle on the, uh, on the Oslo option, which was the second option. Could I follow up with that? Um, in a recent American television program, Frontline, they were focusing on the battles in Syria now, and they seem to intimate that Iran now has control of Syria. Is there any room left for any kind of peace process between Israel and Syria? I don't think it's very likely that there will be a peace process between Israel and Syria anytime soon. To begin with, Syria now is not a real state. It's a, it's a failed state. Assad has control of maybe 60% of the country, not of the whole country. Uh, the, must, the real masters of Syria are uh, Russia and Iran. Um, and then there are Shiite militias from Lebanon, from uh, Iraq, from Pakistan and Afghanistan. There's, there's, no, there's no regime or country or state to, to make a deal with. Second, I don't think the, if, if it occurs to any Israeli prime minister in the coming years to make a deal with Syria, the Israeli public will not support that. The Israeli public would look at the history of Syria in the past few years, since 2011, and would tell the Prime Minister that you must be out of your mind to think of making a deal with Syria now. So I think that's off the charts. When you speak about Arab-Israeli peace process, today you speak about the Palestinian issue, the Syrian uh, out. And by the way, uh, people speak a lot about the Arab peace plan, the Saudi peace plan, speaks about return to the 1967 borders. If we ever come to discuss or negotiate this with the Saudis or with other Arabs, they will have to modify that because 1967 borders also refer to the Golan. And the Saudis today would be the last ones to support that notion. Um, actually, Itamar, can you, uh, can you say a few words about the other peace partner that, uh, that Rabin had, uh, which is uh, Jordan and King Hussein, um, Jordan-Israel peace treaty under Rabin um, and the relationship between the two leaders? Uh, Yes. When, uh, when Rabin began in, uh, inherited the Madrid peace process uh, from the Shamir government, there were four Arab parties. 
Syria, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and the Palestinians. Out of these four, only two could make the first deal. It would be either Syria or the Palestinians. Jordan was a, a monarchy with legitimacy issues in the Arab world, and the Palestinians, uh, and the Lebanon was a client, and is a client of, uh, of Syria. So uh, a breakthrough had to occur either with Syria or with the, uh, or with the Palestinians. Uh, Rabin had a, a very close relationship with King, King Hussein, uh, a friendship, uh, very much, if, whatever I said about his relationship with Clinton was also true of his relationship with, with the king. And I would say peace would not have been negotiated but for that personal relationship. There were good state reasons for making that peace, but the personal trust and personal relationship between these two leaders uh, made the, the crucial difference. Now, of course, Jordan did not like the Oslo Accord, but uh, they had to swallow hard, but paradoxically, it helped them cross the river in, in a way and make the deal because they, they, they had to be in the game. And, and, and so, uh, paradoxically, the Oslo Accord legitimized the Jordanian deal and uh, facilitated it. Now, here again was another point of tension with the administration because the administration wanted the second deal to be with Syria. And Rabin said, no, the second deal will be with Jordan. Uh, for one thing, they are ready, and number two, it's not going to be controversial. I don't have to give up a lot of territory to make peace with Jordan. So after the agony of Oslo, I want a, a palatable uh, peace treaty with, uh, with Jordan. So uh, these were the heydays. Uh, of course, King Hussein, if King Hussein were to run for office in Israel, he would have won. He was very popular in Israel. Very good. Um, other questions? I'm looking at our list over here. Anybody? Anybody want to uh, press uh, star four? Because I could continue asking into more questions for the rest of the day. I'm enjoying this. You know, while uh, Rob, while you while while you're waiting, I want to say something about King Hussein. We yes. speak a lot about about leadership. Uh, there was a, a terrible incident when a Jordanian soldier killed uh, several young Israeli schoolgirls. Uh, King Hussein flew into Israel, went to the village where these girls came from, and knelt before the family and asked for forgiveness. There was nothing undignified about uh, an Arab king kneeling before a grieving Jewish-Israeli family. It only built his uh, stature. So uh, he was a, a king uh, coming from a very noble Arab family who knew exactly what dignity and nobility were about and was a model of, uh, uh, of leadership. Um, let me, if I can, ask you uh, a final question about, again, picking up on a comment you made earlier in, uh, in your presentation, Itamar, and bringing it to today's politics. Um, you referred to the fact that uh, that Rabin led the brigade that fought in Jerusalem and that he had a very close uh, personal connection to Jerusalem. Um, uh, I want to ask you about putting that in, in contemporary political context. How did he envision Jerusalem um, in uh, whatever political resolution might, uh, might emerge with the Palestinians or whoever he'd be negotiating with? What sort of attachment did he what sort of attachment did he think the state of Israel should have with the uh, the city of Jerusalem? Okay, the in 1967, shortly after the the victory in the uh, Six Day War, the uh, municipal area of Jerusalem was dramatically increased, and villages and and places east of Jerusalem that had not been part of Jerusalem under the Jordanians were added to to Jerusalem. I think it. Had, if Rabin thought about compromise in Jerusalem, it would have been these areas because they were really were not part of Jerusalem. The part that he was really attached to was uh, the old city. Uh, that's where one of the burning wounds in, in, in his psyche was the fact that his unit in the 1948 war could not, uh, uh, could not defend the Jewish quarter they had to withdraw and the Jewish quarter capitulated and, and people capitulated and it was lost uh, for 19, 19 years. 
uh, the old the Jewish quarter in Jerusalem was the place where Rabin's parents met for the first uh, time during the Arab riots in 1919-1920. Uh, so I think there, there would have been no concession. In the outlying areas, there was plenty of uh, space for compromise. All right, with that, I'm going to thank you and thank our uh, cross-country team of uh, book readers for joining us for this inaugural book webinar. Um, uh, again, uh, congratulations to you on this outstanding achievement. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining us for this conversation with Itamar Rabinovich. Uh, thank you, Shelley, and uh, thank you all of our trustees and donors and supporters. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.